Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Running. Any of you runners? You're a runner? You're fast. Awesome. Anyone else a runner? You're all insane. Right? Like, like running's not, that's not natural. When I grew up in my family, the saying was often expressed in my family that the only reason to run is if you're being chased. How many of you agree with that sentence? See, we outnumber you runners. Running's a weird thing, really. It requires discipline. It requires patience. It requires commitment. It requires endurance. Matt, for example. Hi, Matt. Matt has been running every day for the past 120, no, 1,200 days. Every day. 1,200 days. So just really quickly, several people asked me at 8 o'clock, Pastor, why didn't you run on the treadmill and preach to us from the treadmill? And I just gave you the answer, why? Because <laughs> Matt has been running for 1,200 consecutive days. And I think you would agree that there's a little bit of a difference between me, who doesn't run, if I were to get on the treadmill today, and Matt, who does run. Is that fair? Actually, my last year of the seminary, I decided to try and get into shape. Now, I want to be clear, round is a shape, but I tried to get into a different shape. And so I committed to working out every single morning, to, to, to start by walking and then gradually work into running. And, and, it, and it was great. The first week or so that I did it, I had a two-mile loop that I, that I planned out. And so I took off at 7 a.m. in the morning, and I, and I started my loop, and lo and behold, it was awful. It was awful. I worked hard. My hips hurt. My knees hurt. It was, it was painful to run those two simple miles. And yet, I kept going because I wanted to get in a different shape. And slowly, something fascinating happened. The more that I ran, the, the easier it became. And suddenly my two mile loop wasn't that big of a deal. And, and so I pushed it to a three mile loop. And suddenly that wasn't that big of a deal. And I pushed it to a five mile loop. And suddenly that wasn't even all that taxing. And so I pushed it even further to a seven mile loop where I would take off from the seminar and run through Forest Park on pretty much every road and every trail. And it was awesome. And then as we approached Cold Day, um, I decided that the, the three guys that I kind of shared life with through the seminary, since we were soon parting ways, that it might be helpful for us to work out together, to, to just spend some time, some morning. And so I said, hey, you guys want to come join me? And they were like, yeah, that sounds great. And I said, we'll even just walk. We won't even run. We'll just walk. It'll be, it'll be awesome. It'll be good for us. We can walk. We can talk. We can spend some time in the morning. And so we took off and we ran, the walk, I mean, walked my two-mile course. And we, and we entered the seminary and we climbed up to the top of Art Hill. You all know Art Hill, right, in Forest Park? We all got up to the top of Art Hill. And one of my dear friends sat down on a bench. And he said, I'm done. And we said, what do you mean you're done? He's like... John, this is killing me. And I said, we're, we're not even like halfway yet. We, we got to keep going. And he said, I, I'm beat. I don't walk. I don't run. This is really hard. And I said, Mark, you can't be done. We're not home yet. Like, we're not going to leave you here. We're not going to go get a car and come pick you up. You have to at least get up and muscle on. You have to endure at least until we get home. And so he got up with the encouragement of his fellow brothers in Christ, and we got him home. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. The next day, he was not a happy man with me. He was sore. He was tired. He was worn out. But that's what happens, right? As we, as we exercise, we get stronger. Even when we want to quit, we, we, we push through. See, today is all about faith. It's all about faith. 
And faith is just like this. Faith is one of those things that is challenging to us when we begin to exercise it. Our brain gets in the way and we think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Or our heart gets in the way and we think, oh, no, I need to be determined by what I feel, not by the truth of God's word. Or our lives get in the way where we realize that when God calls us in faith to, to believe him, to trust his promises, sometimes that, that challenges the way we were raised. It challenges our family relationships. It challenges many things. Faith is not simple at times. Today is all about faith. In fact, it's all about the move from faith being some cognitive thing that we're like, oh, sure, I have faith, to in fact becoming the motivating force in our life, this thing that conditions the way that we live. Because faith is not cognitive. Faith, like running, is about action. You'd be hard pressed for me to say, hey, Matt, you want to come over to my house and we'll go running? And he would come dressed in his and his duds, and then I would take him back to my screen porch, and we'd plop down on the couch, and I'd say, cool, we're running. That doesn't work, right? That's not actually running. That's, that's sitting. Faith is just like running. It's an action word. It, it is the move from thinking to, to actually trusting in the promises of God, so much so that you, that you condition your life to be built upon those very promises. That's faith. Grab your Bibles if you would. We're going to spend some time in Hebrews chapter 12. If you're new with us and you didn't bring your Bible and don't have it on your phone, that's cool. Grab a Bible from the pew in front of you if you have super x-ray vision because the print is really small and you can follow along there with us. We're going to Hebrews chapter 12. If you're new to the scriptures, Hebrews is towards the back of the Bible. So just go to the back and flip forward carefully and you'll find Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. The writer to the Hebrews is trying to do something very specific. He is speaking to people who have existed in a form of cultural faith. Meaning their faith has not mobilized them to transform their life. Their faith has been something that maybe they were raised in. It was routine. It was taken for granted. And the writer to the Hebrews is making a very intentional case to them that faith is not about this cultural thing. It is, in fact, about believing the promises of God and trusting in the promises of God so much so that you will act on the promises of God. If you look at chapter 11, just flip back one chapter. If you look at chapter 11, the heading, at least in my Bible, is headed with these words, by faith. And the writer then proceeds to walk people through the entirety of the Old Testament scriptures, at least the entirety of substantial stories in the Old Testament scriptures, showing uh, how God has been faithful to his people and how his people have acted in faith, believing God's faithfulness. In fact, 17 times in chapter 11 alone, the writer to the Hebrews uses the phrase, by faith, to either kick off or integrate into the middle of his sentences. Faith is the whole point. He says, by faith, verse 3, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. Verse 7, by faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events unseen, constructed an ark. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place. Verse 9, by faith, he went to live in the land. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah received power. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham went up. 20, by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings. 21, by faith, Jacob. 22, by faith, Joseph. 23, by faith, Moses. In fact, I want to read the Moses part too, just so you get a, a sense in actual context. It says this, starting 11, verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden 
for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. And it continues. By faith, God's people live. That this is the challenge. It's, it's not just church thought. It's actually the empowering force that conditions and transforms the everyday activities of our life. Faith is part of the Christian life. Faith is what we do when we gather around the Lord's Supper and we receive a little hockey puck of bread and a little shot glass of mediocre wine by faith. We believe that God is actually present and what he speaks to us is true, that his body and blood are there with the bread and the wine and we receive them to strengthen us in our daily walk of faith. This morning at 8 o'clock, we had 12 young people who came to communion for the first time by faith. They proclaimed their faith and then they participated in this activity of, of strengthening faith that God gives us in Holy Communion. In an hour or so, we'll have another 12 students who will stand up and they will proclaim their faith in confirmation. They will say that they want to own their own faith, that they want to live in faith, allowing God to transform the realities of their daily life. Faith is a big deal. In summary of this section of highlighting all of the people in the Old Testament who lived by faith. The writer to the Hebrews says this in chapter 12. You heard it read, but I want to read it for you again. Therefore, there's your transition word that harkens us back. What's he talking about, right? So anytime you read that in the scripture, you should go back and read what was before it. Therefore, he says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, meaning all the people that he just spoke about by faith, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us run, not sit, not soak, not sulk, but run. Let us trust God's promises enough that we run in life. Even when it's hard, even when it's challenging, even when it presses against us. In fact, the writer says, let us run with endurance. This morning, I grabbed one of our confirmation students and I said, hey, uh, let, me, let me read this to you. What do you think this means? Not that I didn't do my sermon prep, just so we're clear. I, I just asked them, what do you think it means to run with endurance? And she thought for a minute and she said very thoughtfully to me, pastor, it means that sometimes it's going to be hard. Like endurance is a word that means you kind of push through the pain. You endure the hardship. I love our confirmation students who sometimes get it more so than we do. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Not sitting on our couch, but running, trusting that God's promises are true. How, how, do, we, how do we run? How do we, how do we keep running in the midst of life's hardships? How do we run with endurance? Well, see, here's the beauty of the scripture. It actually answers that question. Keep reading. We run by looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Today is Palm Sunday. This important day in the church year, which celebrates the beginning of the end, if you will, for Jesus. Jesus has been conducting his earthly ministry now for a few years. He's been alive as an incarnated human being for a few decades. And he makes his way to Jerusalem one last time. It opens on Palm Sunday where he, he climbs on a donkey and he's led into town and people, woohoo, Jesus, yeah, Jesus, Hosanna. And they celebrate Jesus. Only to have everything go south in a couple of days. When Jesus goes from the exalted king of God's people to the suffering king who is arrested in a garden, who is falsely accused and wrongly condemned, who is beaten and spat upon and mocked and ultimately nailed to a cross. And on the cross, hanging on the cross, Jesus is offered sour wine to fulfill the scriptures. And right after that, Jesus utters words that should strengthen all of us. Jesus hanging there in pain and anguish, bearing the weight of our rebellion against our Heavenly Father, says, it is finished. His race his running with endurance was over. And because his running with endurance was over, we can be strengthened in our ongoing running. We can be strengthened to push through the pain. We can know that Jesus has finished the race. And we've already seen what the, the after race celebration looks like. It looks like the resurrection. But until that day, when he returns and raises us, all of us, to new life with him, we keep running, looking to him as the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who allows us to see clearly that God keeps his promises, so much so that we can we can, we can run so, so much so that we can actually move from cognitive faith to functional faith. We can trust God because God's will is always what's best for us. We know the finish. We know how the race ends. And though we might be tempted at times like my friend at the seminary to plop down on a bench, put your arms up and say, I'm just done now. That's not how the race works. And in those moments, we look to the church, we look to our brothers and sisters, we look to Christ to give us strength to stand again and keep on running. That's actually the Greek word here for run. It's not translated very well in English. It, it actually, the text reads, and let us keep on running. It's a present imperative for those of you that are linguists. Let us keep on running, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, today we give you thanks that you have given us life, that you have given us faith, God, that you have, have taken us and you have bonded us with your will for the world. You have claimed us, God, and, and made your promise true in us. Lord, let us trust it not just intellectually, not just culturally, but let us trust your promise in Jesus Christ that our lives might be, might be transformed, that, that, that our faith might become the mobilizing force in the way that we live, in the decisions we make, in the people that we invest our time and our energies into. Lord, may faith become our mantra in life. Lord, I thank you today for, for crazy people like Matt who agree to come and be a living object lesson for us. 
And Lord, while running looks easy for him because he's been running for so long, I ask that you would make living in faith easy for us as well, Lord, as we day in and day out go through the paces of trusting you and your promise. That as we do that, Lord, each day you would make us stronger in the faith. You would allow us to seek out and live through bigger, more challenging moments. Because God, it's that which makes us stronger. It's that which increases our trust of you. Lord, your will is always what's best for us. May we trust it and may we live it daily. Thanks for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Thanks for Jesus who on the cross declared it is finished and showed us what the end of the race looks like. We love you, Jesus, but far more importantly, far more importantly, we know that you love us. We pray this in your name and all of God's people said, amen.